The reason we wanted to get together was really to try and mark the occasion of the launch of uh, this new publication. The collection of case studies on a variety of areas of work that are relevant to reducing the impact of natural and man-made hazards on communities. We at IOM have been working uh, with our partners quite intensively over the past three years within the MIKIC, the Migrants in Countries in Crisis initiative, and in particular those relevant to the inclusion of migrants in disaster risk management. IOM engages to directly contribute to the operationalization of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and other elements of the global development architecture. So in order to better uh, highlight some elements of this publication and speak a little bit more to the topic uh, in particular, uh, I am joined today uh, by three uh, important representatives of these efforts. Uh, to my immediate right, I have Mr. Dennis McLean, who is the head of communications for the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, ISDR. Uh, Ms. Fuhrer, to my left, who was part of the previous panel, uh, who is the Deputy Executive Secretary of the European and Mediterranean Major Hazards Agreement of the Council of Europe and served as one of the editors uh, of this publication. And lastly, to my far right, uh, Lorenzo Guadagno, uh, who is working uh, with IOM here at uh, Geneva headquarters as Capacity Building Officer, um, also having served with the Migrants in Countries in Crisis Initiative Secretariat for the past couple of years and also one of the editors of this uh, publication. So I think we'll start with, uh, with Dennis. Thank you very much. I mean, it's always good to put a human face on these issues. And this week, uh, I, I had the good fortune to meet uh, a lady from the Philippines who works as a housekeeper in the building where I live. She's been living in Geneva for six years illegally. She has four children, the youngest of whom is two years old, or is eight years old. But the last time this lady saw her child was six years ago. She's in the position where she cannot return home for, for reasons that are quite obvious to us. And the only contact she has with her family uh, is by Skype every Sunday using her iPhone. And she was telling me this week that her latest concern, she comes from a part of the Philippines which was badly affected by Typhoon Haiyan in uh, 2013. It devastated many parts of the Philippines, particularly the area where this lady comes from, which is not far from Tacloban. Over 6,000 people died in that disaster and some 13, 14 million people had their lives disrupted by it. And by disrupted I mean loss of livelihoods, loss of their homes, loss of access to schools, loss of access to education and uh, enhanced uh, food, food insecurity. All a perfect cocktail to encourage migration from that part of the Philippines. They've had almost a thousand aftershocks ever since. So this poor woman here, in uh, this migrant here in Geneva, her concerns are not just about the daily struggle of surviving in Geneva without being, uh, you know, taken into custody and, and forcibly repatriated to her home, but it's also her concern for her four children, it's her concern for her extended family, and I think that paints a vivid picture of the uh, many challenges and obstacles to living an ordinary, fulfilling life that uh, many migrants face. Th these studies uh, in this book show, I think, illustrate to us how difficult it is for migrants to use the experience they may have had in a country like the Philippines to improve disaster risk management in the host country where they find themselves. I suspect myself that the inclusion of migrants in uh, disaster risk management planning is very low. In 2013, we, gave, uh, we, had a, we conducted a survey, it was the first time ever such a survey was done, of people living with disabilities and what were the challenges they faced living in hazard exposed areas. One of the most remarkable statistics from that survey was that only 17% of respondents were aware of any disaster risk management plan in the area where they lived. And even fewer had actually been consulted on that planning process itself. The reason why this is such an important issue is because we saw from uh, a survey just released by the Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre earlier this month that last year, just in last year alone, there were 20, over 24 million new displacements as a result of disasters. Almost four times as many people were displaced by disasters last year as were displaced by conflict. We know 
that uh, the three countries in the world where displacement is the biggest problem is our India, China and the Philippines, just looking at absolute numbers. Of course, proportionately, small island states are even more affected by uh, internal displacement as a result of natural hazards. But there is some room for hope in terms of improving the, the situation of migrants and potential migrants if we look at what's being done in those three countries. In China, for example, China is the only country in the world which has set a target of 1.5% threshold for losses, economic losses in terms of GDP, which shows that they are fully politically committed to avoiding uh, huge waves of displacement in China itself. And if we look at India, India is probably the first country in the world to introduce a national disaster management plan based on the uh, Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which sets seven targets for reducing disaster losses. And the one most important to our discussion here today is target B, which is reducing the numbers of people affected by disasters, and by extension, reducing the number of people likely to be forced to migrate as a result of a disaster. <coughs> Last year, the UN Secretary General launched this campaign, and the first year we focused on highlighting examples of countries who have done a fantastic job in reducing the numbers of people dying in disasters. And this year, the theme of the year will be uh, home, safe home, reducing exposure, reducing displacement. And IOM and the Council of Europe will be key partners in our efforts to draw attention to this issue. Already, 87 countries have voluntarily submitted uh, their data on displacement and mortality as a result of uh, disaster events, natural hazards. We need to find out more about displacement, what, what are the triggers for migration, especially in relation to natural hazards. And I think this publication has ma it makes a great contribution towards that work, and we'll certainly be highlighting it between now and October the 13th, which is International Day for Disaster Reduction. And I would invite all of you here today to give some thought to how you can personally or through your organizations can contribute to make this year a success and how we can focus as much global attention on this issue as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McLean. Dr. Fuhr? Yeah. I just wanted to recall uh, how Council of Europe met IOM in that context. So we launched that our project in 2014. And the starting point was then that little had been done uh, to include migrants refugees, asylum seekers, and the organizations representing them in relevant frameworks and practical programs of action, and their voices are rarely heard. So we in the Council of Europe, we work uh, mainly with uh, civil protection actors. They represent their national governments, and through them they, we, we try to identify first the needs of the countries, and then we try to uh, reply and satisfy their needs through our work, meaning uh, um, setting up reports, uh, putting uh, together recommendations and guidelines how to translate these political recommendations into practical work in the countries. And we had the idea together with Lorenzo and his team and our team that we should collect all the good uh, experience in the field. and. Uh, uh, IUM uh, Michits having um, rather the uh, experience uh, outside of Europe, we are having within Europe, but also we have been working with Japan, so we really put all the experiences together, did a launch, and then we, we tried uh, to see what, uh, what of the proposals we got after a call um, could be included in that uh, presentation we are uh, here to to be launched today. I'm glad that we managed and that we are here today. And I also wanted to thank uh, our partner and uh, Lorenzo in particular for his work he has been putting into coordinating that uh, major publication. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Fuhrer. Lorenzo, over to you. Thanks, Mechthilde. Thanks, Dennis, for being here. The idea behind it was that based on the, on, the, on the experience that we've seen in, in, in previous disasters, we know that migrants are affected alongside population and we know that they are often 
more vulnerable. They suffer more. They suffer for a longer period of time after the immediate impacts of a hazard are absorbed by the rest of the community. We reached out to a series of stakeholders. Uh, Vincent mentioned it. It's state actors, non-state actors, NGOs, civil society organizations, migrant organizations themselves. And we really try to pick practices that could give um, examples of work along the whole spectrum of disaster risk reduction activities. So in particular, we try to look at um, data collection, so how migration flows and, and displacement flows affect uh, the amount of people that are in at risk areas and how those movements, which are maybe rapid and unplanned, can actually be integrated in disaster risk assessments. We looked at how can um, organizations and, 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 and disaster risk management actors collect data on the vulnerability of migrants that are living in at risk areas. So what kind of factors migrants are actually facing that, mean, that the rest of the community might not face? What are their perceptions of risk, etc.? And we have examples from Turkey and the Philippines on that. Um, we looked at uh, ways in which migrants can be actively involved in disaster risk management activities as volunteers, as staff members of disaster risk management or, uh, organizations. The participation of migrants and the awareness of migrants to, of disaster risk reduction efforts is really low. Uh, and there have been a number of efforts, um, in particular in Japan, in Germany, in Australia, uh, in a variety of countries um, that we have um, shown in, in this publication to directly target migrant groups uh, to try to find volunteers and staff members to try to diversify the, 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 the personnel of uh, disaster management actors in order to better uh, in, include migrants. Um, we have a couple of examples from uh, Norway, from Japan, from Bangladesh of ways in which local authorities and non-governmental organizations have tried to include migrants in basic service provision in, 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 in the provision of normal public basic services which build resilience to potential disasters. So more kind of a longer term approach, more development related rather than just focusing on, on preparedness response, but definitely uh, equally important. Um, another few examples, for instance, from Germany, Mexico, Thailand, come from organizations that have tried to build the cultural competence of their personnel. So civil protection, uh, disaster management organizations that have tried to make their personnel more able to respond to situations in which a variety of different individuals with specific language skills, with specific cultural needs, are affected by a disaster. And those are um, some of the kind of uh, longer standing examples of work. But work that is often done in an ad hoc manner and not necessarily uh, supported by a, a, a longer term engagement and commitment by, by these organizations. Um, we have looked at examples of collaboration and coordination among different actors, including mandated disaster risk management, disaster risk reduction actors, and non-traditional disaster risk reduction actors. So for instance, community-based organizations that would work with migrants and provide services to migrants in normal times and that are the first point of contact for migrants that are affected by disasters. Um, and so um, these might not be specialized in disaster response at all, but they become uh, basically the, the first options for migrants who might not trust or might not want to uh, get in touch with um, mandated disaster management actors. Um, and, and lastly, we have looked at a few case studies, for instance, from New Zealand, from the island of Montserrat, of, um, from Japan as well, of migrants that have been actively involved in recovery planning. And, and we've really seen that post-disasters efforts are where the active inclusion of all minorities, of, of migrants in particular, actually falls short. While response activities are often um, provided without looking at documents, without necessarily um, caring for um, a person's migration status, in longer term efforts to rebuild, reconstruct and recover um, legal status linked with, with migration, um, cultural needs, uh, language proficiency, trust in, in the institutions, they really play a role. Um, and exclusion of migrants from recovery in the long term. I, uh, each case study identifies a set of recommendations which we have tried to, to compile um, in the conclusions and, and, and we have really um, distilled it into a, a few key concepts. First of all, we need awareness and commitment to this issue uh, by the 
institutional disaster risk management actors in areas of destination. They need to know that migrants are there, they need to know that they contribute to the community in normal times, and they need to understand that they have a, a requirement to assist them and include them in, in preparedness uh, response and, and recovery efforts. And also a, an upside to, to all these initiatives, while they might be very um, the ad hoc, small scale, um, they are also very visible and they can be powerful ways of changing the discourse on migrants in host societies. They can be very, they can graphically show uh, how migrants can actually contribute to host communities uh, and therefore might have um, much deeper, much more profound, longer term impacts in terms of migrant integration, migrant acceptance in the host society. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. And that's very much the approach that we've had as IOM uh, across a whole number of, um, uh, of global intergovernmental UN-led processes and initiatives uh, to try and, and connect the dots and ensure that the migrant perspective and the displacement perspective, human mobility perspectives, are well understood and factored into these various processes. Uh, whether we refer to the Sendai framework, as you, as you mentioned, Dennis, but also the topic that we're all seized with uh, these, these two days, the Global Compact uh, on Migration, um, and they are bringing the disaster preparedness and, and such elements into the migration discussion, so it really goes both ways, but very similar discussions took place over the couple of years that the development of the 2030 uh, development agenda took. Uh, it was not an easy enterprise uh, to try and bring the migration dimension as an element of development potential into that particular sphere. And of course, using the, um, uh, what Lorenzo referred to, the, um, uh, the best practices identified at local level across a variety of, of local actors. And I think that's an important element that we're not necessarily um, focusing on always the same level, the national level, let's say, of, um, of, of member states, but also looking at um, um, you know, all sorts of institutions, traditional and non-traditional uh, government-like uh, counterparts to try and address these elements. Um, I was particularly interested in the fact that you all highlighted the, um, the lack of data, of adequate data when it comes to mobility, um, but also in general I think a lot of our analyses continue to be derived from, uh, uh, from inaccurate data or impartial partial data only. Uh, and certainly when it comes to migration, um, there remains a lot to be done uh, to achieve um, a higher degree of, of reliable data. The Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, which you've mentioned, is probably the most sophisticated approach we have as a collective, uh, as a community, uh, to try and work together towards uh, putting numbers uh, on, on internal displacement. And even that still has gaps, particularly when it comes to natural disaster and hazards related internal displacement as opposed to conflict related uh, internal displacement. Uh, certainly an element which, uh, which IOM is, is trying to work on together with many of its partners. I know the OECD, for example, is also uh, quite engaged uh, in this area. And I'd like to encourage you now um, to perhaps ask questions or, or provide some comments um, on the basis of the panel's remarks. I see, I see MC. You know, how are, how are these, uh, these people on the move from the, from, from the disasters, how are these people on the move recognized? Are they migrants? Are they refugees? How, how can, uh, you know, m member states uh, categorize them or otherwise uh, be able to handle them and give them the, the protections that they need based on their, uh, their status, whatever that status is given? Thank you. There is, of course, at the global level, not an indicator on displacement currently under the Sendai framework, but there's the option, we hope, for countries that are affected and have significant numbers of displaced populations and migrants also affected by disasters, to integrate those clearly articulated into their strategies with clear targets and indicators. And it would be great to hear from your experience and from the research you've done whether you think there is real potential in that now and whether there's appetite and whether IOM is working with countries on this. Thank you. Yes. As you know, Peru is an area uh, with a lot of er earthquakes. So we are working now, uh, we are trying to be in a work with the Secretary of Risk, the National Secretary of Risk, in order to prevent uh, the situations. In our uh, migratory national policy, we have included one group is the, the foreigners, the migrants who, uh, who are in our country.
as one of the uh, four main uh, groups of interest uh, of our work. So we are trying to work with the disaster uh, prevention, and we would like to, to know if uh, there are some recommendations to work with this group. Thank you. Yeah, well, a theme running through the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction is inclusion. And uh, I think it's a very important moment uh, for a lot of governments around the world to take the opportunity of going towards implementing the Sendai framework to ensure that migrant groups are included, that their voices are heard, as uh, Bolivia seems to be doing, and that that example is replicated elsewhere. I mean, for example, the opportunities are great. I mean, the, the India, since it adopted the uh, National Disaster Management Plan based on the priorities of the Sendai framework, held its first national platform for disaster risk reduction. Over 7,000 people participated in it over a number of days. That was a great opportunity for migrants' voices to be heard, people at risk of displacement, etc., for that issue to come to the fore in the discussions on how practically they are going to implement the National Disaster Management Plan in India. And I would encourage uh, you know, countries around the world convening national platforms for disaster risk reduction, looking at introducing legislation to embed the principles of the Sendai framework in national legislation for the protection of people uh, living ex in uh, disaster exposed areas to consider the voice of migrants, either migrants already established in your country or areas where migration flows could come from, could be initiated as a result of uh, a natural hazard or a calamitous event. You know? So I think it's very important to keep that issue to the fore. I think it was a great pity that um, in the uh, World Conference, the UN World Conference, at the UN World Conference in uh, Sendai, Japan, uh, two years ago, it's a great pity that there wasn't a stakeholder group for migrants, to my knowledge, there wasn't. I mean, there were stakeholder groups for many other uh, actors, you know, science and technology, farmers, etc., trade unions, they were all well represented in uh, Sendai. And similarly in Cancun, the meeting we, the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction, which just took place in Cancun, Mexico. So I think, uh, I don't know, I have no uh, brilliant suggestion as to how this could be done or how it could be managed. But I do think uh, it would be important going forward that at regional platforms for disaster risk reduction, which take place every two years, that we do hear the voice of migrants whether it comes through IOM or IOM-assisted groups or whatever, I think that is very important now as we begin to realise the sheer size and scope of this problem. Even if we're you know, lacking on, on a lot of the data, we do know it's a huge problem and a huge issue. And it's one that will only grow to be more, uh, more of a challenge as we cope with climate change, rapid urbanisation, you know, rising sea levels, uh, environmental deterioration, all the classic drivers of disaster risk, they're also classic drivers of migration, you know, so we need to, you know, take that on board and uh, not treat migration as some kind of, you know, peripheral side effect of these, you know, of disaster risk, but as a central core issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Dr. Fuhrer, would you like to add? Just to add that uh, we have, uh, at the end of the project, no, that one, we have done uh, over three years, we have uh, edited the recommendations to governments how to translate uh, these issues into national legislation. And we have also drafted guidelines going with it, how, to, how this could be done and what pitfalls should uh, be, uh, we, we should be aware of and so on. So we have the guidelines, uh, we have been giving it uh, a thinking, but then it's up to the governments to translate that, and it's, uh, I wanted to congratulate you uh, that you did that in Peru, and perhaps you could send us uh, something, what you have done, uh, and we can promote that, and you can, well, we can go uh, in, a, in a consultation process and uh, exchange our expertise to move both your and our work further. Lorenzo. Uh, in terms of data, um, the approach that we've, we've, we've tried to pursue was that 
since it's so difficult to get individual data on people on the move, especially where their status is undocumented, um, we have tried to go through proxies, basically. So trying to analyze, uh, try to get in touch with community leaders, with um, non-governmental organizations that know the migrant community. Again, this only produces partial data, but that partial data is already uh, more and more meaningful than no data at all. And it means that one can have an idea of the basic characteristics of a community, of um, its size, more or less. So our, our idea has been to basically build some sort of community profiles for the different migrant community, for the different community groups in an area, and try to integrate that uh, into um, disaster risk assessment, basically. So in, into, and, and the example that is in the book actually uses data uh, similar to what our displacement tracking matrix or the kind of data that, that, that you produce through IDMC um, in order to uh, input it into uh, assessment to, of, of future risk, basically. So um, th th those are two quite different um, things, but the idea is really to try to, um, to, to, try to have different data sets and data sources better communicate in order to um, in order to produce a better picture of potential uh, future risks um, and in terms of, of capacity building efforts actually our office in Peru is is um, started thinking about uh, implementing these activities in the country they they have they are drafting a scoping study of migrants presence the risks they are facing uh, so it is something that might naturally follow up uh, in terms of uh, at least a proposal to the government and see how um, these kind of initiatives can be addressed. Um, what we have learned from our experience, in particular in Mexico and Thailand, um, is that it is much easier to work through uh, institutional organizations that migrant trust, whether it is their, their leader, official or, or non-official, but still formally recognized by the community. If it could, could be through um, their, their, their groups, Again, formal, informal structure. No, sorry. In, in Mexico, it was through the Grupos Beta, so these kind of um, institutions that assist migrants along migration routes that did not have strictly a disaster risk management mandate, but they've started collaborating with the civil protection. And they are part of the, um, of the immigration department, basically, but they do not have immigration enforcement uh, duties. And migrants know it, and they trust them. So the idea is really to try to involve as much as possible these um, bodies at different levels or these individuals, I think, that can um, bridge this gap between government and migrants um, and that can facilitate migrants' involvement, engagement in these programs and potentially that can become your trainers, can become your, um, at least your contacts with, within the community, I think. Thanks, Lorenzo. And perhaps just to add to that, IOM in particular has been quite vocal in advocating for a wide understanding of what a driver for migration can be, uh, understanding that it does not necessarily need to be limited um, to conflict-related elements. Uh, and I think, first of all, that is a major um, potential overlap uh, between our considerations within the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Migration if we only have a narrow focus uh, on, on conflict elements. And secondly, because the reality of migration is a lot more diverse than that. Um, and we wouldn't want to be boxed into um, um, a conflict-related discussion. And so we've tried to highlight um, the disaster related elements within that particular thematic consultation, but even the terminology calling this consult, this thematic uh, elements, um, you know, the drivers of migration, including, you know, all sorts of uh, issues that mostly link uh, to conflict related elements is not helpful to try and, and bring to the fore um, disaster risk management um, type uh, conversations. Secondly, I think, um, Disaster management agencies are not necessarily well represented uh, in the intergovernmental uh, discussion. And so that's, that's also um, a bit of a gap we've identified and an effort we're trying to make is to better um, take into consideration to try and provide a forum for disaster, disaster um, management um, institutions uh, to be able to bring their own perspectives uh, into this particular conversation. Um, I cannot tell you much more about it right now, um, but I think it, re it remains a challenge. It remains to be seen whether uh, concern and consideration for this particular uh, dimension is sufficiently highlighted so far in the member state-led considerations. Of course, this is not a process that um, 
IOM is leading, uh, it's very much for member states to be seized uh, with, um, with the matter. And so I think it is our collective responsibility to also make sure that we do highlight um, uh, those elements uh, in whatever forum and, uh, and occasion uh, we are given to do so. Um, in particular, civil society organizations, I think, you know, there's been, um, I think, a real effort made by uh, member states uh, and the General Assembly to try and carve out a space for civil society organizations uh, to have their voice heard throughout the um, negotiations uh, that, leads, that will lead to the uh, adoption of a global compact on migration. And so we're, we're hoping that uh, some of the regional consultations and the global elements uh, that will take place in the next few months will allow for that to happen as well. Uh, and I'm hoping ICMC and uh, particularly UNSDR as well uh, will be able to support us uh, in this matter. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much.